Okay, so uh, let's take it to the Lord first, like we do each week. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for tonight. I pray that you would bless everyone out there. Meet their needs, comfort them, let them draw near to you, and I pray that you just bless this show, give the wings a mighty voice, take it to the four corners of the galaxies and beyond, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so the show, this is part seven of facing adversities in life and coming out a victor. Uh, you can see the rest of the shows on our YouTube page, and I reach Bible Church, you can go to the playlists and see everything we do on there. Um, and tonight's topic is running to the right place to hide, okay? Running to the right place to hide, which means, because you always know how I like to flip these things, if there's a, a right place to run to, there's also a wrong place to run to. But we're going to get to that later, and remember with the show, you guys, uh, I can see what most of you are saying, uh, we have Rich filling in with us uh, on tech tonight, and... Uh, uh, so I don't see everybody, but for the most part, I can see your comments. So if you want to comment, you want to question, Rich, if you see anything on there, let me know. Um, so this is an interactive show. We're not going to do the phone thing tonight. It seemed like we tried doing call-in phones. Everybody was afraid to call in. So we might do that later uh, in, in the year. Uh, well, later in the year. The year's almost over. We might do that again in January. Let's see how it goes. But let's get back to uh, the series and just a refresher uh, of how it how it went and why we're doing this. Uh, we we spoke about you know what if you've been alive for a very short time, the first thing you know is you have to face adversity. I don't care if you're two years old. I mean, a one year old, you're gonna fall down, you're gonna get a diaper rash right away. There's adversities, and it doesn't end. It just gets bigger and bigger. And uh, it's great when you're a kid. You don't think so, but you know, mom and dad take care of all your adversities for you. And you just cry and say, fix this toy, and they fix it for you. But when we get to be older, and it's kind of funny, we can't wait to get older, right? And I can't wait till I can stay up as late as I want. You know what happens when you realize you can stay up as late as you want? You want to go to bed early because by that time, you got to go to work. And you're like, I don't even want to stay up till 1 in the morning. i got to go to sleep. And uh, so when we can do anything we want, we don't want to do it anymore. It's the irony of life, right? It's the irony of life. Um, oh, boy, it's funny. So facing adversity. So we're going to face adversities. And each week I keep on telling you guys, you know what? When you face adversities, many times you're going to lose, okay? And that's not being a downer. That's not a glass half full guy. That's a fact of life. And that's, I've said it before. I think if you have any type of brain, you know, problem with our society today is no one knows how to lose. You know, when I was a kid and we played games and we played, you know, some people won, some people lose, and that was it. And everybody had a good time. But everybody has a puss on their face. They can't lose. They can't be wrong. And uh, it's a problem. But if you're, if you're an adult and you understand these things, you know that sometimes things are not going to go your way. Anybody out there have anything not go their way, right? If you've, if, I'd like to have you call me. If you've never had anything not go your way, let me know who you are. I'd like to hang out with you. Probably would be fun because you're a very special person. Uh, but... If you're like me and most people, things don't always go our way, do they? Now, we can walk away from that adversity, no matter what it may be, financial, romantic, mental, uh, emotional, situational, family, work, whatever it is. You can walk away a loser, or you can walk away a loser with a little bit of wisdom in, wisdom in your hands, Okay. Let me say that and clarify that again. I want to teach you guys about facing adversity, which means you're going to run into a problem and things are not going to go well. You can walk away from that defeat a loser, or you can walk away from that defeat a loser who took something with them. They took virtue. They learned something and said, you know what, it wasn't a total loss because I walked away a little smarter. People, as we get older, we're supposed to be getting smarter. We're supposed to be probably losing less because we learn as we get older 
well, that was a dumb thing to do. I don't think I'll do that again. I got burnt by that person. It's probably my fault. I don't think I'll do that again. You see, if you can walk away from adversity with some wisdom and knowledge, you're not really a loser, okay? You actually gained something from the adversity. You know, you became, you know, a little bit better than you were. And we need to look at losing as not so much losing as, well, I, you know, I tripped over something, okay, a couple of times, and I realized, you know what, if I remove that thing, I don't have to trip over it anymore. I'm a smarter person. I might have fallen down. Uh, did anybody have this happen to you? Because I always used to see it in, like, cartoons. It never really happened. It happened to me once. Uh, did you ever see in a cartoon, they have a rake laying down, and the rake's parts sticking up, and you step on it, and the thing comes up and hits you in the head, and you say, that never really happens. It actually happened to me as a kid. And ever since then, my father said, don't leave the rake like that. It's one of those metal rakes that have the, you know, the tines to face up. I remember one in, the, in a friend's backyard, and his father and the kids had a rake like that. I stepped on it, and they actually did come up and hit me in the head. You know what? I'll never leave a rake down like that again. Okay? It only happened to me once. <laughs> so I, I, hurt, I got hurt. I learned, you know, and it was painful. I felt embarrassed, too. Because everybody was laughing, but you know what? I learned something. So it wasn't really loss if I gained something for it. Isn't that how we learn? We learn by making mistakes. You know, as a mechanic over the years, I've, you know, I've learned about better ways of doing jobs in the past where I'd bust up my knuckles and do all those things. And I would say, well, that was it. I'm not going to do that that way. I'm going to learn a better way. When we're young and we're prideful, you know, we don't like people to, you know, to tell us how to do things. But when you get older, you say, you know what, you got a better way to do this break job? Well, tell me about it. I want to know. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you got some secret, let me know. You know, and uh, over the years, you know, I've learned that. And I say, I, I become a wiser person. So that's what this series is about. And uh, we have a couple of scriptures that we use as a foundation. Ephesians 4.31, let all... Bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Uh, Proverbs 14, 29, He that is slow to anger is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of spirit exalts folly. Uh, and we have a couple more scriptures. The soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up strife. And we were talking about over the last couple of weeks how we make sometimes a situation worse than it was by how we respond to it. Okay, has that ever happened to you where you have a situation where how you responded actually ended up being worse than the situation itself? Uh, let me see what we have here. Hey, we see Tammy is watching. We got Trevor from the Jeep Club is here. Cool. Uh, and let's see. What is Jen? If things went my way, I'd be living in a mansion. <laughs> that is true. Like Elmer J. Fudd, I would have a mansion and a yacht. <laughs> Uh, but they don't go our way, right? We don't always get what we want. Uh, but as the Rolling Stones say, but you get what you need. Is that how the song goes? You can't always get what you want. But if you try sometimes, you get what you need. See? You learn something from the Rolling Stones. Pretty cool, huh? Eh? Uh, pull some virtue out of the Rolling Stones. There isn't too much virtue in the Rolling Stones, but there's some there. A Rolling Stone gathers no moss, okay? As they say. Anyway, tonight, running to the right place to hide. So what we're going to do tonight, you know, we're going to talk about, we get into an adverse condition, a problem, a situation. And now many times we need to face them, we need to deal with them. But sometimes, sometimes we do need to hide. We do need to run away from it for a while. Um... It's not always a bad thing, okay? Sometimes we need to run. But not running away so much, but running for shelter, okay? If, what, what, would, be an, what would be an example, okay? Uh, let's say uh, you're riding a motorcycle, okay? And it starts to pour out, okay? Well, you could drive faster on your bike, and try to get away from it, 
Or you can pull under an overpass. If you ever watch guys on bikes, if it's raining out, they pull under an overpass. Okay? They didn't necessarily run away. They ran to shelter. Okay? They ran to shelter. Hey, speak about bikes. We got my friend Pastor, uh, Pastor Ski from Washington Biker Church is on there. Hey, Jim. Good to see you. Uh, so, you know what, that's a wise person. The fool tries to go faster to outrun the raindrops. And hey, a little bit of trivia. Uh, I used to love the show Mythbusters. Okay, I used to love that show. And they did one show of a myth that if it's raining out and you run or walk, do you get less or more wet? And they found out that when you run, you actually get more wet because you're throwing more rain on you. But what do we do? When it rains, we run <laughs> for shelter, we think. But they actually did it scientifically. So, hey, who knows? But, again, when we face adversities, you can run away from them or you can run for shelter. For shelter. See, that's what matters, people. Okay? Because today... I think we are a society who is really, really running from everything, okay? People are just, you know, they have a problem, they can't deal. I mean, every week it's more and more I get calls and, and people who are just really struggling emotionally. I was talking to this one young lady uh, last week and uh, she was just, I, I can't do this anymore, parents. I can't. You know, it's this, you know, with this thing and that thing, and now there's another variant thing, and it's freaking me out. I, I can't do it. And people want to run. They want to run away. But you could run away, but where are you going to run to? You see, you have to run for shelter sometimes. Uh, if you live on Long Island, I, and I guess a lot of uh, big cities, people are running away, okay? People are moving. Why are they moving? Yeah, I know financially they're moving for financial reasons, and I understand that. But a lot of people are running to get away from the evil and the sickness and the problem and the corruption. People, where are you going to go? Wisconsin? I don't know. You're going to go to the Arctic Circle. Maybe you can get away from a lot of people. But you know what? You can't run away from problems. You have to run to something. Okay? You have to run to It's okay to run. As long as you run to something and not away from something. And uh, it's just something that's happening. But what happens when we run? Well, or who do we run to that can be not a good thing, okay? Sometimes we run to friends. We run to people who are going to tell us what we want to hear. Did you ever notice that? That if you have a group of friends, right, and you have a problem or you were hurt or whatever it is, you tend to call the friend who's going to always side with you no matter what. Gee, if I call Steve, he'll always be on my side. Even if you rob the bank or whatever, he'll always say, those dirty banks are always out to get you. No matter what, Steve will always be on your side. And we tend to run to people who will give us the answers that we want. They'll tell us what we want to hear, but not necessarily what we need to hear. Because you all know you have that one friend, at least you, I hope you do, who will tell you like it is. Okay, You guys know with me. You know with me. If you come to me for advice, I will not tickle your ears. I will tell you hard truths. And sometimes people leave and they never come back and they don't like me. But I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear. I'll tell you what you need to hear. And sometimes it hurts. But we don't like to go to that. Sometimes we run to family, right? When we got problems, I'll, I'll run to my family. Then when my family can't help us, then we're angry at the family instead of the problem that made us run. Sometimes we run to politicians, this politician, that, but they're all going to help me. You know, someone help me. You know, uh, we run to science, we run to doctors, and sometimes you should. I'm not saying that you shouldn't. Uh, but if you have a plumbing problem, right, you don't run to your doctor, you run to the plumber. Sometimes we run to illegal drugs, drinking, right? People want something to run to that they think is going to give them an escape. And in all fairness, you know what, when we run to these things, 
you know what, if they didn't give us a temporary escape, we wouldn't run to them. They do give us an escape. When you run to drugs or drinking, yeah, you'll feel numb for a little while, okay? But not forever, you know? I, I know a big thing now, everybody's all excited that smoking pot is like going to be legal, and it's, well, it is legal here, I guess. It's going to be legal everywhere, and... Uh, and I, I and I dealt with people, you know, so, you know, Pastor, you know, I can't help it, I, you know, I need to smoke some pot just to get, you know, it just, and you know, it's legal, Pastor. Now, right? so they always tell me, I said that's fine. I said, but so is poison ivory, but I don't, you don't see me wiping my butt with it, okay? Uh, it's 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 still not good, okay? It's still not the solution. And people, where are people who want to be numbed? Okay, and still, instead of dealing with the obstacle in front of us, we want something to put a band-aid on it or to make us not have to deal with the pain. But sometimes you've got to deal with the pain. Sometimes we run to sex. We run to affairs. Sometimes we run to anger, as in self-righteousness. Well, I'm right. And if I have to be by myself, then I'll be by myself. If no one sees that I'm right and they're wrong, well, then I'll just live all by myself. And we convince ourselves that our righteous indignation is justified and everyone else is wrong and we're right and we live in that shelter, that false shelter. Some people run away. This is a kind of a paradox. Some people run away by staying home. Okay? Do we see that a lot today? People say, you know, I'm just going to stay home. I'm not going to work anymore, I'm not going to go out anymore, I'm not going anywhere, I'm not going to church, I'm, just going to sit. I'm going to stay in my room, I'm going to stay in my room forever, and I get under the covers, and I'm going to hide there, okay, staying home, sometimes, you know, we stay home and we do it with a vengeance, well, I'll show them, see how it, see how it, it looks when I'm not around to help them, you know, people, it's, Funny how we run away from life problems by running away from life. Did you ever notice that? We run away from life problems by running away from life. Okay, Thinking that I'll just run away. Today, running away is, is the most popular thing. But And I've shared this with you guys before. Uh, when I moved to California to take over my first church, part of me going there was thinking that, wow, California is going to be great. Kind of, I hated New York, and it's going to be sunny every day, and uh, you know it's going to be so much better with a new life. But you know what? I hated California. You know why? Because when I got there, I followed. Okay, and, and I started to feel, or I started to realize, it wasn't people in my life that I was running from. I was trying to run away from myself, and I thought if I was somewhere else, I would be a different person. I don't know, this is a true story, it's funny, I don't know if you guys ever did this. Every year in my life, especially as like uh, when I started going to junior high school and then high school, every September I remember walking to school and going, this year I'm going to be different. This year I'm not going to let anybody push me around. This year I'm not going to be the, the same schmo I was last year. I'm going to be cool, I'm going to have, you know, and I, every year I have this talk with myself. But the problem was, is, you know what, I tried to run away from who I am, but who I am is who I am, and we have to deal with where we are uh, at the time. You know, you can't just, it's like everyone, you know, I know people, every time they have something that breaks, they get rid of it. You know, they have a lawnmower, that, it doesn't work, they throw it out. <laughs> it doesn't stop, I'm throwing it out. I, I know people like this, snowblower, I picked up so much stuff that people threw out, pull, stop, it doesn't work, I'm throwing it out. I'll buy a new one. You know, uh, you have a car, it breaks like three times, I'm just going to get rid of it. You know, people don't realize, you know, sometimes we've got to stay with where we are and fix it. Find out why it's not working. Okay? So we've got to be careful with this running under the covers or running into someone's arms. Isn't that what we want? And we all do, and I don't think it's wrong. You know, you want to be able to come home. I was just talking to uh, Rich here tonight about this. You know, I really do feel, you know, uh, I guess I take for granted. You know, I was single for a long, long time, and I hated it. And then I got married, and I guess I've been married for, I just celebrated 35 years. And I take it for granted, because uh, I know a lot of people who are single, 
And you know what? Life is hard, but going home in this hard world to an empty house, that's even harder. And I do understand that. And sometimes we just want someone's arms to grab us and tell us it's going to be okay. Hey, did you remember? This is true. I'm not kidding. It must have been about three or four years ago. There was a company that was formed, Hugs Are Us. They actually, you would, because people were such in desire for hugs. I'm not kidding. You can look this up. It was on the radio. It's really true. I don't know whatever happened. Well, probably COVID probably destroyed it. But you can call these people and they come to your house <laughs> and for a fee, they give you a big hug. Okay, nothing sexual, just a hug. <laughs> and people were calling them. <laughs> It, you know, so, I mean, there is something to be said about a hug, okay? It's, you know, it's, it's true. But what I want to talk about tonight is what you will not find when you run to something that can't be protection. It can't be a shelter for you, okay? What you will not find there is peace. Okay? You won't find peace and you won't find true safety. Let's see, we have some comments here. Jen, why do you think I work <laughs> with three-year-olds? That's true, Jen. That's true. Uh, endless supply of hugs. Yep, kids like hugs. You know, I have to say, my kids, I raised all my kids. I have three boys, and we've always been a big hugging family. If you see any of my boys, whenever they see me, and it's pretty cool. They always hug me. Hey, Dad, we always hug. We're, you know, we're not like this, guys don't hug. We hug. And we do real big hugs. It's a big thing. You know, we've always, and they hug everybody. They're always hugging. And, you know, there's a lot to be said about hugging. There's nothing wrong with that. I think we could all use a good hug some days. But what I want to talk about tonight as we get into this topic. You know, so we, we spoke about all the things that we shouldn't run to and the reasons why we shouldn't run to those things. But I'm going to tell you what you should run to, which is not really running away. And, and I know when I say these things, you're going to say, well, that's just wishful thinking. That's a nice thought, Pastor. But that's not reality. That doesn't really do something. But not so, people. Not so. Because, you know what? You could run to... I'm going to pick these states. It seems to be... I tell you, I, I know more people who have left Long Island, New York, and moved to North Carolina than I could, put a, than I could shake a stick at. I tell you... Everybody around it, where are you going? North Carolina, North Carolina. So you can run to North Carolina, okay? You can run to South Carolina. A lot of people go into Florida. You can go to your bedroom. You could run, do you know you could run to self-pity? You know? People can run to self-pity. I remember watching a Seinfeld episode. George Costanza says, you know what? Pity is underrated. It's good to have pity. People feel bad for you, you know? Sometimes we live for pity, right? It's, you know what, I can't be happy, but at least, at least people feel sorry for me. Did you ever feel that? You know, you want, you know, after a while, your whole life is, yeah, it's going pretty bad. Because you just want to have people, you poor thing. Oh, man. And all of a sudden, you start feeding off the pity. It becomes like a drug. So we could run to self-pity. We could run to our bedrooms. We can run to self-righteousness. We can run to isolation. Everyone hurt me, so I'm going to hide from them. You can run to Florida. You can pick a state, people. Or you could run, and you know where I'm going to go with this. You, or you could run to God. Okay, and listen, when you run to God, you're not running away. You're running to a shelter. And I want to talk about uh, a great scripture, Psalm 32, verses 7 through 8. It says, Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Selah. Okay? And part B is verse 8. And when we do that, it says, God says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way that you should go, and I will guide thee with my eye. So that's the scripture that I want to talk about tonight. Uh, <laughs> what is the one saying? It's a country song by Tanya Tucker. You can't ever run from yourself. Really? Okay, I didn't know that. Did you know that, Rich? Okay. 
Tanya Tucker, I haven't heard that name in a long time. I remember her. Uh, so let's look at this scripture because there's a lot to it. Okay, so if you have it, this is a good one to save. If you have it in your Bibles, write it down. Psalm 32, 7 and 8. Okay, so we have the psalmist saying this. Thou art my hiding place. Okay, now what does that first part there mean? It means it's not something that I'm not sure of. It's not something that maybe I'll go to. No. This is what I do. Every time I'm hurt, every time I'm afraid, every time I'm confused, every time I don't know what to do, this is where I go. I don't go anywhere else. And notice the term hiding place. Now, it doesn't mean hiding from the problem. It means hiding from all the decisions you might have to make about that problem. A chance to get away, okay, in your prayer closet, whatever. So you can regroup, find out how to handle this before you jump back in. It isn't a place that you go there and you live far away from your problem. You go to God and you hide in Him until you get the comfort and the answer. I mean, it's not that you stay away from God, but when you go to Him, you go to Him to find the answer. Why? It says, because thou shalt preserve me. What does it mean, thou shalt preserve me? Well, people like who can, like my wife used to do preserves and, you know, peach preserve and stuff, is you take something and you seal it in such a way that it's, it's good for hundreds or years and years and years. It lasts for a long time. Something preserves you from the outside elements. When you run to God, God preserves you. He protects you from the lies, the cheating, the hatred, the worry, the fear. Okay? You go under his protection and he preserves you. Why? I mean, if you if you like bottle peaches or apples or whatever, you don't keep them in there forever, right? You preserve them so you can open it up again and something that you can use. God preserves us from the problem. So we can be instructed and then go back out better than we were before. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Okay? Now people say, well, so if I go to God, I'm never going to have trouble. No. It means the effects of that trouble. Uh, the fear of that trouble. Okay? We're going to have trouble. You're always going to have trouble, but you'll be able to deal with that trouble if you run to the right person and you don't just run away from it. Uh, I just want to say hi to a couple of new people out there. I see Dave is watching. Who else did I see out there? Mark, uh, Yolanda, okay, and Jim. Hey, guys, good to see you. Thanks for joining the show tonight. Okay, so thou, shalt, thou art my hiding place. And you need to ask yourself, What's your hiding place? You might say it's God. I might say it's God. But in reality, where do we run? Okay? Sometimes we run to things that are not good. Sometimes we run, you know, we run to the quick fix. Sometimes, you know, guys could run to pornography. Women could run to shopping. I'm not saying that women always go shopping. I probably get in trouble. But uh, I did know a lady who every time she was depressed, she goes, Oh, as a matter of fact... I know a couple of people, and I've heard this a lot, and, I, and I'm and i not given a commentary on tattoos, good or bad, but I know this person, every time they're depressed, they get a new tattoo, and they're covered in tattoos, they're going to run out of space for tattoos, but they would tell me the only joy I have when I'm really, really in a bad place is I get another tattoo, and that's fine, but, that's, but does it help you? Does it change anything? You know, I have nothing against the tattoos, I'm just asking you. You know, you run to that as a hiding place. Sometimes I think it's the pain, because uh, a lot of those people uh, also cut. And, and there's a little bit of a psychosomatic connection there with the pain of the tattoo. You know, pain displacement. In case you don't know this, I, I actually counsel a lot when cutting became a really big thing about 10, 15 years ago with young people, especially women, you know, people who cut themselves with like a razor blade, their arms or their legs. Uh, <laughs> Mary says, not going to look so pretty at 70. <laughs> yeah, I always say that. Really, people with tattoos, when, they, when, they're, when they're all in the 
nursing home, all those tattoos are all going to droop. <laughs> it's going to look funny. But anyway, uh, cutting uh, has become a big phenomenon. Men do it, but it's normally young teenage girls, okay, by far. And uh, when we've done st studies on this, what we found is quite interesting is that people who are really emotionally in pain, they found that when you uh, inflict yourself with physical pain, it actually displaces the emotional pain. You see, your mind can't focus on two things at one time. You can't focus on an emotional pain and a physical pain. Okay? It would be like if, you know, you had a toothache, you're like, oh, and, and somebody says, I actually saw this in a movie. I think it was called uh, Sergeant Pain. It was kind of a comedy. And this uh, kid had a toothache, and the guy came up to him, what's wrong, you got a toothache? Because let me have your finger. He breaks his finger off. He goes, now you don't got a toothache. And, and it, it actually does work, and people start to get addicted to the pain and they what happens is they cut further and further it's never enough pain and then they cut and then they look to see blood and there's some there's also some uh uh psychology involved in that and when the blood starts to come out they start to think it's the bad pain of their sorrow coming out so it's a hard thing and i've dealt with that a lot in, with people and but we do that too on different levels Okay, we'll inflict one set of pain, like you know, you have a broken heart, so you'll go out to the bar and get wasted, you get drunk. Okay, you replace one pain for another, but you haven't accomplished anything. But with God, what does He say? Thou art my heart. Now, this is the psalmist talking to God about God. Thou art my hiding place. You are who I go to. Why? You preserve me from trouble. And you compass me about. Now the King James uses these big words, compass, which we get the word compass from, which is kind of a picture of a circle. Okay, you surround me with songs of deliverance. Okay, what does that mean? And always when the scripture ends in the word selah, some people debate what it means. I believe it means pause and think about what you just read. Songs of deliverance. When you go to God, what does he tell you? You're going to get through this. You're going to trust in me. You're a child of God. I'm your father. Okay? Greater is he that is with you than, than he who is against you. Nothing is going to separate you from my love. Okay? Uh, nothing is impossible. He's going to whisper in your ears the truths about who he is, despite who we are. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt circle me around with songs of deliverance. That's why it's so important to, you know, if you run away from God, and it happens all the time, people do it all the time, especially in church. Problems, the first thing they do is they run away from church. Run away from God, run away from everything, and they hide. And like I said before, it's like having an open wound you know, and you have an artery and there's blood pumping out, but instead of going to the hospital, you say, I'm not going to the hospital. There's a bunch of sick people there. I'm going to go to the beach and I'm going to just bleed out there. No, you go. You don't stop going, okay? You know, what, what's the church but a hospital for, for sick people, right? For sinners. And, and that's where we go. Okay. So, verse 8. So, verse 7 is the declaration of the person saying, Okay, when I'm in trouble, when I don't know what to do, I have a place, that, not that I run to, but that I hide under. And what is something that hide that you hide under, what does it do for you? Well, think about the biker guys under the overpass. It's, protect, it's protecting them. Has it stopped the rain outside? No, the rain's still pouring down. It hasn't stopped the storm, but it gives them a temporary, temporary reprieve to do what? Are they going to live underneath there? Unless they're, you know, trolls or something. They're not going to live underneath an overpass. They get their breath. They wait until the storm passes. And then they go back out. Okay? That's what we need to do. And that's what God is saying here. And when we do, verse 8 says, now, now we hear God speaking in rebuttal. I will instruct thee. When you run to me 
and hide to me. Hide under my wisdom. Hide under my guidance, my comfort. When you do, I will, not maybe, I will instruct you. And I will teach you in the way. We've been talking a lot about this at church. There is a way of wisdom, there is a way of God, and there is a way of the world. You have to choose what way are you going to go. God says, I will teach you in the way that you shall go. I'll tell you where to go. I'll show you where to go. I will guide thee. And this is interesting. God uses this term. I will guide you with my eye. Well, now, why would God say that? Does God have an eye? No, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, there's a technical term for it. Uh, uh, us ascribing, uh, uh, physical features to God. God doesn't have eyes. Uh, I think they call it anthropomorphical or something like that. Uh, but, He's saying, from my vantage point, I see much more than you do. I see who hurt you. I see what happened. I see what's coming. I see where you came from. Let me guide you from my point of view, right? Did you ever, well, you probably didn't, but if you ever thought about it, if you're in a traffic jam and everybody's just stopped and it's, just, it's one of those crazy, like leave, trying to get off of Long Island here. Now, you have one view, one perspective, but the person who flies over in the helicopter, the traffic helicopter, he has a completely different perspective. He sees past the traffic, past the accident, past the problem. He's not really too concerned about it because he's above it. And God isn't concerned about our problems because he's above them. Okay, we're, a, we're concerned about our problems because we're in them. But God says, I see with my eye what you don't see. Trust me. You might want to get off at this exit. Don't. Okay, well, don't turn around because you don't know what you need to do. I do. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which you shall go. And I will guide thee with my eyes. But the question is, okay, that sounds great, Pastor. It's really awesome. Uh, love it. Um, but how do we do that? You know what? And this is something that Bible teachers do, pastors do, and even counselors do. You know, we can give you a lot of these cool, you know, uh, anecdotes and uh, uh, object lessons of the helicopter and the car. And it sounds really great, but, but how do you really apply that? Hey, this, this scripture here, Psalm 32, 7 and 8, sounds great, Pastor. Wonderful. But how do I do that? I don't see God. How can I run under his wing? How can I make him my hiding place? Well, I'm going to tell you what you need to do. How do you do it? You get into the Word. You open up the owner's manual for the human soul. I'm going to be talking about that Sunday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Why it's so important. People, you try to figure out on a new car just how to turn on the radio or set the clock. I mean, you need that manual. You need to have somebody train you. It's so complicated. And you think the human life isn't, le isn't any, any uh, less complicated? You need the manual. You need to know the one who made you. Only he knows. Okay? So you go to the Word. You study the Bible. You get under a good Bible teacher. You go to a church that teaches, and you worship together with other people. You don't run away from people. You worship together with them, whether you like them or you don't like them. You know, people don't come to church for the people. Come to church, or and don't come to church for the pastor. Come to church for the Word. That's why we come. We come to hear the Word of God. Because if you come just because there's nice people, that always might not be the case. There will always be someone who hurts your feelings or whatever. If you come for circumstances, you'll be, you'll be disappointed. And I said this a couple of days ago. I, I know when this new variant came out, uh, people were oh, freaking out again. What are we going to do? And, and I made this point that, and I said, did you notice that every time circumstances circumstances change, our, our joy and peace goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down. When things seem to be going well, our joy goes up. 
When circumstances change and get bad, our joy goes down. Why? Because we're basing our happiness on circumstances. Favorable, unfavorable. Okay? Things are getting back to normal. Things are not getting back to normal. And what does that leave us? A very unstable people. Okay? The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. We're up, we're down, and we're getting miserable. I don't know about you, if you go up and down like this too much, you get seasick. I know I do. Okay? But you have to fix your sight on something that stays the same. They say, it doesn't work for me, but they say on a boat, because I get seasick. That's probably why I have this ship fixation. But last time I went on a boat, I went to Connecticut. Matter of fact, to pick up Andrew's Jeep, when he bought his Jeep, we picked it up in Connecticut. And uh, uh, we went over on the ferry. Man, I got so seasick. It was a real kind of one of those ooh, days like that. And they say if you fix your eye in the horizon, something that doesn't move, okay, you'll be okay. But if you fix yourself on other things, you're going to get unstable. So that's what you need to do, people. You need to fix yourself on something that doesn't change. What doesn't change? God's Word. It's The Bible says it's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And think about the owner's manual scenario. Does your owner's manual ever change? No, you can have, no, I have a 1965 Mercury Comet Cyclone. The owner's manual for it hasn't changed since 1965. It stays the same because the car stays the same. The world, it's kind of funny, you know, I got this old car and uh, I think, wow, 1965, I was born in 63. That car is old, is almost as old as me. And wow, has the world changed since 1965? Yet that old car drives through the modern world around it. And it still gets through. It doesn't need the technology of today. It uses the technology of the past. But anyway, so how do we hide in God? We hide in His Word. We go to Bible study. We go to church. We worship. Read devotionals. How many people out there, if you haven't gotten one, you let me know. Okay, I'll get you one. God is Faithful by David Wilkinson. Get that devotional. Okay, read it every day. It's a great devotional. Not perfect, but it's a great devotional. One of my favorites. Prayer. Go to God in prayer. If you want to get alone, get alone with God. Get alone with God. Alone time with Him. I do it every week. Lately, I've been doing it more. I spend a lot of time get in my truck, and I just drive. You'll find me drive. This past this other day, I drove so far out on Sunrise Highway, man, I just kept going and going. And I just pull over and, and just pray and think and just be by myself. And But not away from God. I was running to God to, you know, to draw close to Him. And what happens? What's the result? Okay. Psalm 37, 7. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospers in your way, because of the man who bringeth equal devices to pass. Cease from anger, forsake wrath, fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. That's a big thing, and I've been learning this a lot also, and uh, I've been reading this book, it's blowing my mind. It's taken me three years, and I'm only three quarters of the way through. I'm, I'm reading, uh, I'm a big fan of Watchman Nee, a famous Christian uh, who died for the name of Christ in China, and uh, I'm reading this book called The Spiritual Man. Uh, it's just mind-blowing. But one of the things I've been learning about in this book is what makes you truly a mountain of a spiritual person is to not react so quickly. Wait before you react. It is so, so important, people. And get along with God. Think before we make hasty decisions that we're going to regret. We can't run from the world. We can't run from our methods. And we can't run, well I should say, we can't run to our methods. We can't run to ourselves. We can't change our problems because it's usually our methods that brought about our problems. Think about that. A lot of times what we've done have brought about the problems, at least how we handle them. No, the answer is to go deeper 
into God. I would even go as far as to say that God might allow some things into our lives just to force us to go deeper into Christ. Okay? That's what he always wants. And either we do it on our own or he has to give us a reason to. He wants to be with us. And it, and he wants a, a deep, deep relationship. And it seems the more problems I go through, the deeper I get with God, the more I get to spend time with him. Because when things are going well, I don't really want to hang out with God. It's kind of a sad thing. But anyway, uh, we're kind of getting close to the close to the show. And um, I give you these last words as we hear our song. Go deeper into God and find rest unto your soul. Hey, Don Rivers from Racing with Jesus Ministries over in Connecticut. Hey, Don, great to see you. Thank you, everyone, for uh, getting on the show here. Uh, yes, Sally, we miss you. Feel better. Uh, run deep into God and find rest to your soul. Make Him be your hiding place. It's not just a, a little trick. It's not wishful thinking. It's not a good luck charm. No, it is fact. The Creator said this. The Creator means it. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great night. Uh, it's great that we had our technology working tonight. We'll see you next week, Lord willing. God bless you.